The next item of business is a Member's Business Debate on Motion 2130 in the name of Johan Lamont on Care Tax in Scotland. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Johan Lamont to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank um, everyone who signed this motion and everyone who's in attendance for this debate. And may I say, I want to particularly remark on the fact that it's the Cabinet Secretary herself who's responding to this debate and recognising the significance of this debate for many people. Can I also acknowledge the work of the Scotland Against the Care Tax, Frank's Law, the Coalition of Carers in Scotland, and all those other tireless campaigners who have focused their attention on the significant issues faced by disabled people and those who need social care. And may I also acknowledge the particular role of my former MSP colleague, Siobhan McMahon, who while here pursued these issues with great passion and commitment and insisted I for one should ensure they should, it should continue to be raised um, now that she no longer is in this place. And I don't pretend to be an expert on these very important issues and I am very grateful to all those organisations which provided briefings for this debate, highlighting a wide range of concerns from the lack of consistency across Scotland, the unmet need of those with neurological conditions but who are under 65, the danger of cost deterring the uptake of low-level preventative care measures and many, many more, too many for me probably to cover in this debate. And I think at the heart of this recognising that for every story, every issue that has been raised, there are human beings behind those stories experiencing difficulties caused not by them, but by a system that does not properly acknowledge their needs. And I'm pleased to say that many of those who really do understand and live with these issues are with us in the gallery tonight and will be involved in a meeting following the debate where we continue this conversation. And I do hope the Minister and others will be able to attend that with us. I think there is a danger in too many debates that we settle for identifying others to blame and set back on what we are doing ourselves. But in building a consensus, I do think there is a central role for the Scottish Government in refreshing its approach, understand and perhaps addressing the unintended consequences of some of their political choices. And so, of course, must local government too in their actions in this area. But what we cannot do is put this issue in a political too hard box, settling for telling people how much we care, but not taking the action that matches that concern. The motion tonight highlights a fundamental injustice, that disabled people and those with long-term conditions like dementia or motor neuron disease are paying more for social care services. That astoundingly, over the period 2009 to 2013, the amount of money collected from older and disabled people rose by approximately four times the rate of inflation. That these charges are effectively a tax that the rest of us do not have to pay. That the disabled people contribute to mainstream services they cannot access without funding the social care that allows them to do so. That the cost of care is availability and affordability, is seeing people priced out of using services with a consequent cost to their well-being and with an impact on their unpaid carers who pick up the slack. We know that disabled people are more likely to be living in poverty in the front line facing the consequences of the austerity approach of the Tory government. But what we should not do is compound their problems with the choices that we make. We know it makes no economic sense ignoring disability-related expenditure, the extra cost of heating, transport and simply living. Denying disabled people who want to work the opportunity to fulfil their potential and to contribute through their taxation, but it costs them to work and their loved ones living with greater stress and ill health. This approach increases costs, increases crisis, and with increased emergency admission to hospital. So instead of preventative spending through proper funding, we are ending up in a position where people can only be supported once they're in crisis. And as we look at our NHS, we know that the solution in large part is to invest in local government, not target disproportionately for cuts. That is a rational means of improving the health and well-being of all of our citizens. So it's a rational and a matter of logic, it's a rational issue and a matter of logic and of justice to address this question. But critically, it is a matter of human rights. This is not about how much we can display how much we care, how much we empathise, about how we can be a little bit kinder to disabled people and those with long-term conditions. No, 
It's how we live up to our oft-repeated commitment to human rights and equality. It's not a maybe, it should be a must. So when people say, well, I get that, there is an issue here, it's just too expensive, we cannot afford to, make, um, we cannot afford to move towards or eradicate care charges. I say this, educating our young people is expensive, but we don't suggest only educating our boys as we cannot afford to educate them all. Why then can it be acceptable to deny disabled people the right to live independently, the right to access work and economic opportunities? Why can it be acceptable that the needs of someone with the same degenerative condition will be supported differently on the grounds of age or because of where they live? We have a fundamental choice here. We can increase the size of the resource cake to meet needs fairly through taxation, or we can redistribute the resource cake that we have currently fairly. What we cannot do in all conscience is shrug our shoulders at what is a manifest injustice and a denial of the human rights of all too many in our communities. In conclusion, what I seek from the Minister is an acknowledgement of the problem and a commitment to act. It cannot be left till some distant point in the future when we will have solved the problem of spending more while taxing less. This is work the Parliament can do right now. We can support the government in developing a, a, a proper strategy, focusing on the injustice of this problem, of a care tax on those who need support services in order to live their lives independently. We need a commitment to justice, working with those who understand best what it is like living with a disability and without the means to achieve their potential. This is an urgent matter. It is a matter of equality. It is a matter of human rights. And I believe it requires in all of us a little bit of courage, the willingness to be bold, to say this is a problem, we can act. We will open up the debate about why taxation can benefit all in our communities, and that a fair distribution of resources mean that we can all achieve our potential. I think this is an area where we as a parliament can come together confronting issues that matter directly to far too many people across our communities. I look forward to this debate and I hope this is just the start of a debate where we will make a difference and will respond to the long-held campaigning convictions of those who deserve the right to equality and justice. Uh, speeches of around four minutes, please. Uh, Graham Day, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you. And can I begin by thanking Joanne Lamont for bringing this debate to the Chamber tonight and for the tone that she struck in opening. This is an issue which is, it is important to address and we need to consider it accordingly, setting politicking to one side and acknowledging there may be a difference between what we might all ideally wish to see delivered now and what might be deliverable in the short, medium and longer terms. What's required is a realistic and informed debate about how it might be possible to meet the aspirations that people affected by this issue rightly have set against the financial pressures the Scottish Government and local authorities face. The fact is there are tough choices to make around what we can and cannot fund. Uh, the case, from the case advanced by the family of my late constituent Frank Copel, who died of early onset vascular dementia and did not qualify for the support he would have had had he been over 65, through the arguments making a similarly strong case for those diagnosed with all types of terminal illnesses or disabilities to calls for blanket outright abolition now. Even the most heartless of individuals would surely struggle to disagree with the merits of the calls they all make. Ideally, abolition of these charges for the under 65s with the difficulties they create for them and their families is something we would all of us aspire to see. Uh, how do you say to any group or individual, whatever the strength of your case in the short to medium term, it cannot be addressed? But if we accept that funding outright abolition, given the increasing demands being made on the health budget, is unachievable in one giant leap, then as Enable suggests, we can still, and I quote, explore some of the pragmatic steps that can make a significant difference on the journey to ending this practice. And more than that, we should ensure the Scottish Government delivers on its commitment to make progress on delivering a fairer system. But for that informed debate to be kicked off, we need to have accurate figures for the cost of abolishing social care charging for all under 65. That's the elephant in the room here. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary, in responding, might offer some hard detail around this, if only to bring some context to the financial challenge concerned. But whatever the costs involved, 
We cannot ignore the case being made here to pursue possibilities for progress and not put it in the too difficult to do box, as Joanne Lamont mentioned. The briefings provided from a variety of sources for the debate contain a number of criticisms of the Scottish Government's provision of £6 million to local authorities to take 800 under-65s out of paying any charges and reducing those borne by 13,000 others. I understand entirely that people and their families in such a situation would rather no one was paying anything, but it was a genuine first step along the road that this motion calls on us to travel. And it was concerning indeed to learn that some councils may have failed to ensure the full benefit of the £6 million was felt by those it was intended to help. Shame on any councils of whatever political hue they, uh, they might be who did that. But I would, presiding officer, just caution about rushing to judgment around such allegations without substantiating them. I was horrified to read an assertion that my own council in Angus had failed to deploy the money for the purpose it was received. That, however, turns out not to be the case. So if we accept that we will have to move forward at a pace and in a way which won't necessarily meet the aspirations of all, then what could we do? The programme for government revealed an intention to conduct a feasibility study into extending free personal and nursing care to those under the age of 65 with a diagnosis of dementia. Can we move forward on that sooner rather than later? What of Marie Curie's call to consider ensuring anyone under 65 given a terminal diagnosis is exempted? What about taking account of any disability-related expenditure before arriving at the point where car care charges kick in? Or the suggestion from the Learning Disability Alliance Scotland that the threshold at which disabled people have to start paying charges is set at £11,000 rather than the current £6,500. It strikes me that in the spirit of exploring a fairer way forward, these are ideas worthy of costing and consideration. In conclusion, presiding officer, can I repeat my welcome of this opportunity to debate this issue and, whilst recognising entirely the challenges, um, encourage the Scottish Government to make pro whatever progress it realistically can towards arriving at a more equitable situation. Miles Briggs, to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating Joanne Lamont on securing this evening's members' debate. The Scottish Parliament passed the free personal care for the elderly policy in 2002 with all party support. However, since this legislation was passed, it's become clear that for many people in Scotland living with a life-limiting condition, unfair age discrimination surrounding access to vital personal care has now become an unintended consequence. At present, anyone under the age of 65 who requires personal care for dementia, motor neurons disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis or Huntington's disease has to fund the cost of their personal care themselves. Since the election, I've met with a number of constituents and organisations who have legitimate and genuine concerns about the current social care charging system for people with these conditions. I recognise the strong feelings that exist and I believe we need to address this issue and respond to the unfairness that is often so very clear to see. There are real concerns about the disparities and inconsistencies across Scotland and the collection costs of social care charges, which make it one of the most in inefficient charges and taxes collected. The motion this evening refers to Frank's law, and along with Ruth Davidson, I recently met with Amanda Capel to discuss her campaign. And I'd like to welcome Amanda and others to the public gallery this evening and congratulate them on the incredible campaigns which they are running across Scotland to try to get the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government to act to address this unfairness. And I'd like to pay warm tribute to Amanda for the outstanding and high profile campaigning work she has personally undertaken to support a change in the law to allow under 65s with conditions like dementia and MND to receive vital support for their social care. Amanda's selfless efforts are to be commended, and I know her determined campaigning will not cease until we've seen a better system put in place in Scotland. Official figures show the number of people under 65 being treated for dementia is increasing, and this trend is likely to continue. Dementia can devastate an individual and their family, but early onset dementia can be even more devastating for family members, and we need to look at how we can better support them to care for their loved ones. The Scottish Government earlier, as Graeme Days outlined, announced an extra £6 million for local authorities to raise the threshold at which people can pay, uh, begin paying for care at home. However, this is only a small improvement and, we need to, and we'll only see a limited number of people actually helped. 
As Graeme Day has outlined, it is vital that the Scottish Government set out in as much detail as possible the accurate costings and projections it has for extending free personal care to all those who need it, broken down by condition, so that we can have an informed debate about how extra resources are needed and how we can take forward a change in this policy. The Scottish Government's feasibility study of expanding free personal nursing care to people with dementia who are under 65 is welcome, but I think it's also important that we look at other conditions like MND and MS, as well as other further conditions like Huntingdon's who are also um, in this catchment. Deputy Presiding Officer, I again am pleased that we're having this debate, which is very timely, and I know that charities and individuals will continue to campaign hard on this issue to press the Scottish Government to act, and I welcome their continued input and efforts. And I hope that we can, as Joanne Lamont mentioned, reach a consensus here in Parliament to provide a better and fairer system of social and care support for people under 65 who are in need of personal care at what is clearly the most difficult time in anyone's life. It's vital that we actually make progress on this beyond a member's debate and that this parliament and this government move this issue forward. And I'd like to suggest to the cabinet secretary the idea that we establish the first ever Scottish Parliament all party working group on this specific issue to look at this issue and try to work to bring forward costed solutions. I hope in responding the cabinet secretary will agree to this suggestion and that we can look to establish this at the earliest opportunity. Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, no illness or long-term condition or disease waits for a person to reach the age of 65. For those who need support with social care, regardless of age, we need to see this recognised and provided for when they need it and where they need it. Thank you. Colin Smith, followed by Joan McAlpin. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I declare an interest in today's debate as a local councillor and also the fact that until just after my election to the Parliament in May, I was employed by Parkinson's UK. Can I also thank my colleague Joanne Lamont for the, the opportunity to debate this important subject of care charges and also, I hope, start a wider discussion on the issue of how we provide and fund social care in Scotland. It is now 14 years since the last Labour-led government introduced free personal and nursing care to everyone over the age of 65. Today in Scotland, around 77,000 older people benefit from that policy. However, if I can echo the words on the Frank's Law campaign website, no disability, illness, condition or disease waits until a person reaches the age of 65 and then strikes. Across Scotland, 90,000 people are living with dementia. Not all of them are over 65. In fact, over 3,000 are under the age of 65. If those 3,000 people require care, they are financially assessed by the local authority to determine whether or not they should make a financial contribution towards that care, and where they live often determines how much they pay. It is the same for many other long-term conditions, motor neuron disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and many others. In our election manifesto, Scottish Labour made a commitment to work towards the abolition of these care charges for those under 65, and I reiterate that commitment today. Yep, no problem. John McAlpin. Uh, I thank the member for taking the intervention. Uh, two points. Could he explain why, given that um, Labour commitment, why uh, the Council in Dumfries and Galloway, Labour Control Council in Dumfries and Galloway, has lowered the threshold at which disabled people start paying care charges, and, and why you have actually introduced a disparity for over and under 65s this year? Colin Smith. Deputy President Officer, I will certainly come to that particular point, a, a policy which, as Joe McAlpine knows, was supported by the SNP councillors. Now, I hope that when responding to the debate today, the Cabinet Secretary will say whether, in principle, the Government supports the commitment towards the abolition of charges, or at the very least sets out a timetable for extending free personal nursing care to those with a diagnosis of dementia, because Labour will support that work. Because this is an issue that goes beyond party politics in the same way it did when Labour introduced free personal and nursing care. It is disappointing, therefore, that again today Joe McAlpine does seek to make this a party political issue by attacking Dumfries and Galloway Council, who, as a direct result of funding cuts, did bring charges in line with most of the rest of Scotland. Historically, the charging policy in that region was more generous than elsewhere. This was not without its consequences. Overspends in social work under previous administrations were common in order to balance the books, and a more generous charging policy meant cuts to services. Faced with this year's unprecedented 4.5% cash cut in the government grant, a review of the policy was instigated as the options for making savings elsewhere became increasingly limited. 
That review began before the government announced the social care fund, but we also know that the financial assumptions made by the government in relation to that fund were flawed. For example, the government initially indicated that the application of the living wage for care staff from the 1st of October would cost around £37 million across Scotland. That's approximately £1.1 million in Dumfries and Galloway. But the actual cost to the Council of the living wage was over £3.4 million. You cannot claim, therefore, there is funding available to ease charges when the package of measures required under the Social Care Fund was in excess of that funding. Faced with £21 million of cuts, councillors reluctantly agreed to bring the charging policy more in line with the rest of Scotland. This policy, as I said, was backed by all councillors and all parties, including the SNP. In fact, if I look at the SNP Group's own budget, where they proposed the change, it showed the additional income raised avoided having to make a further £500,000 of cuts. That is the equivalent of 15 social workers' posts or over 30 carers. If politicians in this parliament want to attack local councillors for making decisions they don't like, then at the very least they should have the guts to say where they would make the cuts. I won't, however, hold my breath. Deputy President Officer, in the time we have to debate this issue, it's only possible to scratch the surface of the challenges we face in delivering and properly funding social care. Addressing individual issues such as social care charges in isolation won't solve the problems. I hope today's debate, however, is the start of a wider discussion of the future of social care in Scotland. Thank you. Joan McAlpin, followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd actually like to change this. Sorry. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Joanne Lament for bringing the debate to Parliament. It's a very important issue and I'm pleased to be able to uh, use it to raise the interests of my constituents in the south of Scotland. But I wanted to start by just deliberately addressing the point that Colin Smythe has just made about uh, choices and, uh, and the kind of cuts uh, that that are being imposed on us, let's not forget, by, by Westminster. And I would suggest uh, an area where uh, his council could save money because his council is, is raising around four, uh, 400,000, 450,000 this financial year on the back of these uh, charges to disabled uh, people. But the council is also spending a very similar figure on a new group of officers whose job it is to shadow councillors. Uh, they're called ward managers and they're on between 42 and 46 K uh, a year. And they're not frontline social workers or teachers or learning support assistants. They're bureaucrats whose annual wage bill costs about the same as they are waging on the charges to disabled people. So he asked me to make a suggestion, so that's my suggestion. Um, yes, I will. Colin Smith. The, the, the member will be aware that that particular option that she discusses was actually a saving because there was a cut in the overall number of staff and all the posts have been filled by existing members of staff. Presumably that's why SNP councillors agreed to that. It didn't actually uh, cost any additional funding, so it won't make a saving. John McAlpin. I, I think that's actually weasel words. They are new posts and they're not frontline posts. And the difference between myself and Colin Smythe is that I'm willing to stand up and say um, that I oppose these charges. I don't care who supported them. Um, I know that Colin Smythe supported them, but I'm, I'm willing to stand up and say I oppose them. Uh, what uh, Dumfries and Galloway has, has done has had a really de detrimental effect on some of the most profoundly disabled people in the country. Uh, one uh, uh, constituent who wrote to me cares for his profoundly disabled son and he's seen charges rise from up to, from zero to 31 pounds 30 a week in the course of uh, the last two years and um, that's over 1600 pounds annually which comes out of his ESA and disability payments and it's a rise of uh, over 500%. Uh, uh, there's another lady, a pensioner, who wrote to me who has three disabled adult children. Uh, she's now paying an extra 60 odd pounds a week uh, to cover both of them. Um, Dumfries and Galloway have defended their decision to hike up charges by claiming that £177 a week threshold um, that they used up until this year was over generous. Um, I think that's deeply insulting and insensitive and um, I think it's, uh, it's easy to dehumanise people by calling them service users as, as some councillors have in the press saying that they were over generous to service users. I think if you say you're over generous to severely disabled people then it, you know kind of 
brings home exactly, uh, exactly uh, what the consequences of what you're doing. Uh, the guidelines published by COSLA earlier this year were intended to protect people in the lowest incomes uh, from charges using the six million uh, that's already been mentioned uh, from the government. Uh, but critically, um, the, the, the amount was not uh, reduced for councils who were, as Colin Smythe might put it, over generous in their payments. They still got the same allocation. And the recent Galloway Council also got £182,000 extra um, as its share of the £6 million. But instead of using it to reduce the charges, they have pocketed it Just and raised the charges time, for those people. So, again, I mean, I, I realise that this isn't an easy uh, decision, but as I say, councillors have choices as well. This is an, an example. We've constantly been told that we shouldn't centralise, that we shouldn't dictate from the centre, but this is a local decision by a local council, and I think it's a very, very damaging one for disabled people in Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you very much. Now, can I ask those in the public gallery, please, just to hold fire on any clapping of hands if you wish to show your appreciation for any member once the Parliament has closed and the debate is over, you're very welcome to do so, but not during it. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I must declare an interest as a serving councillor on Argyll and Butte Council. I would firstly like to join colleagues in congratulating Joanne Lamont on securing today's members' bait, debate uh, on this very important issue. And I'd also like to commend um, uh, Joanne Lamont on the passion she brings to this subject. I thought that was an excellent opening uh, speech. As a former chair of the Argyll and Butte Health and Social Care Integrated Joint Board, I understand the difficult nature of deciding when someone should be charged for services and how much they should be charged. And it's important to keep this debate this afternoon on the level that we're not getting down into petty politics. And I was slightly uh, ashamed of what happened in the previous speaker's comments. Um, <clears throat> it is never an easy question, and for obvious reasons, it creates strong and understandable feelings. A lot of people will see many aspects of the current system as being unfair, whether it be someone receiving different support because of their birthday or depending on where they live. That's why the Scottish Government's announcement earlier this year that an extra £6 million would be given to local authorities to raise the threshold at which people pay for care at home, which was a welcome step, but it's a small one, that can and will only help a limited number of people. And I hope that the Scottish Government will be able to go further in offering that vital level of help in the future. I have some examples uh, where I have been involved with some people, um, particularly a young uh, a gentleman by the age of about 63 here in Edinburgh, where I was a guardian to him, uh, having had a severe stroke. Um, and he received the most brilliant care and into get back, getting back to his rehabilitated position uh, back home from the Astley Ainsley Hospital here in Edinburgh. Uh, but when he got home, being of that young age of 62, 63, uh, there were severe problems financially in providing the full care package that he required, which was obviously put in place uh, by the, um, uh, the, the NHS. And consequently, there had to be some corners cut which didn't really do him any benefit. So I do understand uh, from practical experience what this problem manifests itself in when somebody is under 65. Um, also, um, a, a case uh, in Argyle, uh, where we had a gentleman who, at the age of 10 months as a baby, had a severe operation, uh, brain operation, because he suffered from severe epilepsy, and he's now at age 19, living in Oban, um, and under total care uh, from his parents, who, who give him total overnight care, and indeed care during the weekend. And they share that with the council services and the NHS to provide that. But again, it is, it is stretching the family beyond belief because he falls into that category of under 65 so we've got an awful lot long way a long way to go to try and rectify that uh, and finally they're all too often I hear of cases of people under 60 and I know of two 53 and 54 who have severe dementia and are struggling for care and, and trying to um, finance their care because of their age as a member of the, Scot of the uh, Scottish Parliament's Petition Committee, alongside Joanne Lamont, one of the petitions we are considering is a long-standing petition uh, by Mrs Copel on this subject. 
It is a sign of her dedication and her work that the petition has the support of well over a thousand individuals. And I know that Ruth Davidson has met on several occasions with Amanda in relation to uh, the Frank's Law uh, and the, the question of picking up on that. And we certainly support that. As it stated in our manifesto in May, the Scottish Conservatives have and do support the Frank's Law campaign and most strongly. As the numbers of those of dementia and Alzheimer's who are under 65 goes up over time, and I give you the examples of that uh, before, the question of how we provide support for them is becoming an even more pressing matter than it currently is at present. It is, uh, it is, in our manifesto, it is also stated that we continue to put pressure on the Scottish Government to increase support for dementia sufferers under 65 and will continue to do so till we see some movement in, that, in, in, in the right direction. That's why I'm glad to say that the Scottish Government has a feasibility study looking into the expansion of pre-personal nursing care to people with dementia who are under 65, and I support that. Uh, <clears throat> but as Miles Briggs pointed out, it would be a good opportunity to also look into other conditions like motor neuron disease, Parkinson's, and other conditions to discover what, to discover what the cost of covering these areas would be as well. Finding out how much it would cost to provide pre-personal care to all those in need of care, whatever their condition and individual circumstances, is vital in ensuring that the ongoing debate on this important subject is well informed and based on fact, so that we politicians can make the correct decisions for our constituents. <clears throat> Today's debate is an important one, and one that I'm sure will continue after today. It is going to inspire passions. I know that the charities and individuals are going to continue to work hard to make sure that everyone who needs to is able to access the social care they need. I hope that in the coming months, we in the Parliament are able to work together to create a system that is better able to provide for those people that are under 65 and are in need of that care. Thank you. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I would like to join with colleagues across the Chamber in congratulating Joanne Lamont in securing this uh, very important debate. The motion makes a lot of good points, and, uh, and I would like to uh, point out that the Scottish Government already has a proven track record on free personal care. Uh, this party campaigned and a promise to protect free personal care for the elderly, and the SNP will keep that promise. But of course, as others have pointed out, there is much more that can be done. And in that vein, I welcome the plans from ministers to investigate ways of extending free personal care to other groups who would so benefit from this great service, such as those with dementia, as has been mentioned, aged under 65. And that was outlined both in the SNP manifesto and programme for government. The Cabinet Secretary's commitment to work closely with COSLA to get the best outcome for those in need is to be welcomed. I hope that leaders of the councils throughout Scotland engage fully in that process. President officer, I think it would be fair to say that the Scottish Government is doing what it can to protect those in society in the face of eye-watering cuts, and I don't think that many people in the Chamber would disagree with that. And we often talk, quite rightly, in the Parliament about the vicious cuts being made by the Conservative Party um, to our constituents throughout Scotland, and we talk about how it's a choice rather than a necessity. And I know I won't be alone in this Chamber in, in dealing with a large number of constituents who have been hit by these cuts. And it is in that vein that I have been absolutely heartened to hear the Conservative members' contributions eh, and tone on this issue eh, tonight. And I was also glad to hear eh, Joanne Lamont eh, note that it wasn't just about the Scottish Government or the Westminster Government eh, taking responsibility, but also eh, the local authority. And I know that two of my colleagues have already eh, had a bit of a debate on that. In my own, own area of North Lanarkshire, um, the administration earlier this year imposed a £5 uh, per week charge on community alarms. Uh, and that's, that's a massive £260 a year uh, for some of the most vulnerable people across my constituency. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's also fair to say that for the majority of people who have community alarms installed, it's not simply for the sake of having one. It's a means for them to remain in their own home and for them to know that if something happens, you know, that, they, that, that help won't be far away. And you know, I, I know I'm not great for time, but the, um, I do. You know, there was a case of a constituent who approached me in Coatbridge Main Street just a couple of weeks ago, saying that she'd actually taken the decision to um, get rid of the alarm, and um, she was quite worried about the consequences of that. But for her, uh, would I be able to get extra time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joanne Lamont. 
I wonder if you, I, mean, I hear what you're saying. I think people are making these choices and they're not getting the preventative care that they might get in an earlier stage. But would you not accept that the government has also made a choice? The cuts to local government are higher than the cuts to their budget. And my point is that's a choice they've made, but it's a choice with a consequence, which is they're not able to, they're not able to raise the money themselves. Local government's not able to raise the money themselves. Its budgets have been cut and they're having to make impossible choices. Would you agree with me that maybe we should increase the size of the cake by using our powers to increase taxation on everybody in order that our services can be properly funded? Fulton McGregor. Well, I thank the member for the intervention. I, I, I mean, I think that the point has been made that by all, by all members who have spoken that we all need to work together on this particular issue. And I accept uh, what Joanne Lamont is, is saying in that regard. But I do think that the, the focus I was, I was going on here was in terms of what the responsibility of local authorities is, um, you know, and, and I'm talking about, and, I, and I'm not doing my job for my constituents if I'm not coming here and, you know, saying what's, what is getting to them and what they're coming uh, to my, my surgeries and f I, I'm not going to be able to take another one. So in, in terms of the, the, the community alarm uh, scheme, the, there's also the garden assistance scheme that the same, the same local authority um, reviewed earlier in the year, charging through the roof prices for many elderly um, and disabled citizens uh, to have their garden uh, done on behalf of the council. And I, and I mention these particular um, charges because when a, ch when a charge is placed on a product or a service that's absolutely required as a tax, um, and you know that some of the people that are affected by this are the people that we've been speaking about throughout the debate, and, and they, they are the, the most affected. Um, so I would, just to sort of finish off, I would like to say that um, you know, I agree with the overall um, tone of this debate, and I think that we all we all do have a, a role in working together as parties, and it differently as a government from Westminster, the Scottish government, and uh, the local authority in getting the, the right deal here. I don't think MD uh, would disagree with that. Thanks very much. Um, I still have two speakers left wishing to contribute to the debate, and I won't be able to call them unless the debate's extended. So I am happy to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes, is what the rule says. So um, the question is, under Rule 8.14.3... Oh, gosh, I forgot to have it moved. And there's Miss Lamont sitting with great anticipation. <laughs> Would someone care to move the motion? First time for everything. Can I move a, a motion without notice that the debate be extended? Thank you. I can't believe that's the first time you've ever had to do that. My goodness. So the question is that under Rule 8.14.3, the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? Thank you. I therefore call Neil Finlay to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thanks, Deputy President Officer. I also would like to congratulate Joanne Lamont on bringing this debate forward and to all of the campaigners who have been uh, diligently pursuing this campaign. Like Jenny Mara and uh, my colleague and I, uh, visited uh, Amanda and Frank Koppel's house a few years back in I remain uh, and will continue to be profoundly moved by that experience. But I wonder how many other Franks there are. Franks who don't have an articulate voice, an articulate family campaigning for them. How many other Franks are there out there who don't have access to pressure groups, who don't know the system and who don't get their voice heard they are foremost in my mind uh, today because the social care system in Scotland is in a perilous situation. We see social care providers with severe staff shortages, care staff underpaid, demoralised and feeling undervalued, council budgets being slashed, IJBs starting life making cuts and health boards like Lothian in a desperate financial situation. And whilst government ministers and civil servants claim there are no cuts being made, only efficiencies. Every frontline staff representative I speak to across the health and social care field are astonished at that claim. In these desperate circumstances, it's inevitable that councils will use all their powers to try and recoup money from anywhere to try and keep services afloat. President Officer, let me be absolutely clear from the outset. I am not here to attack councils. I'm not going to play Miss McAlpine's game where she votes to cut council budgets, shackles them over council tax, then turns round and points the finger at the very same councils for making cuts and imposing 
charges, certainly. John McAlpine. Yeah, I, I thank the member for making an intervention. I would point out that I think Audit Scotland pointed out last week that the, um, the cuts to council budgets were the same as the cuts to the Sc Scottish budget overall. However, I, perhaps uh, you know, he might reflect when I, I say to him that the point I made about Dumfries and Galloway was relevant because all the other councils in Dumfries and Galloway's position who had higher thresholds have kept their higher thresholds. Only Dumfries and Galloway has chosen to immediately impose this cut on disabled people across the board uh, for all disabled people. And that's the difference. I totally appreciate that local authorities are facing challenges. Neil Finlay. I look forward to Ms McAlpine voting the right, uh, right, in the, way, uh, the right way when the budget comes before this parliament. Uh, President officer, two years ago I published a report um, from the Labour Party Commission on Social Care. The Commission recommended that we sweep away much of, but not all, of the charging system. It recommended that support with personal hygiene, continence management, meal preparation, mobility, counselling, the administration of med uh, medication and alarms and telecare would be provided without charge. But the local authorities would be able to charge for other support arrangements such as uh, housework, shopping, uh, lunch clubs, meals on wheels. All adults, irrespective of age, uh, assessed as needing social care, would receive it free. Uh, I think that is a sensible, uh, fair and compassionate approach. I don't understand why someone aged 45 with MND, MS uh, or MS or immobile and reliant on care staff for dressing, feeding, washing is denied free personal care yet someone over 65 with the same needs gets it. Now, that's not an argument to deny the over 65s the help they need. It's an argument to say that others need it too and we should care for all our people according to their needs and not an arbitrary date and a calendar. But in sweeping away the charging system, this parliament has to face up to some very harsh realities. We cannot have a system financed by fresh air or left to the vagaries of the government's latest punishment doled out to Scotland's councils. I would like to see social care paid for in the same way as the NHS, where we all pay when we can and we take out when we need. And we could do that through a number of different options, as we identified in the Commission paper. Here are just some of the options that we could, uh, we could look at. We could take a different approach to policy decisions in relation to government spend. We could increase national insurance contributions across the UK. We could use the Scottish rate of income tax. We could implement wealth or property, property taxes. Or my preferred option would be to have a UK-wide tax on estates that would be paid on death by everyone, whether we use so the social care system or not. Services throughout, Can a person's you come life, to a close, please, Mr. services throughout a person's life would be free at the point of access, paid for after the end of life. Whatever we choose, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, and, President Officer, this is about the fundamentals of how we see ourselves as a society. Are we a civilised society that cares collectively for people throughout our Mr. lives? Mr. Finlay, you or must are we close. Not? Thank you. Uh, the last of the open speakers is Alison Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate Joanne Lamont for bringing this issue to the attention of the Parliament. And in the last Parliament, as Joanne Lamont noted, Siobhan McMahon raised the unfairness within the current care charging system with her proposed private members bill. And I welcome the opportunity to return to the issue in this new session. I welcome, too, the call in the motion to explore ways of making social care charging fairer with a view to ending the practice altogether. And I believe, as others do, that it's essential that we do so. As the Alliance point out in their briefing, independent living is a human right that doesn't rely on an individual being able to pay to achieve it. They are right to point out that charges for non-residential care amount to an additional tax on disabled people for accessing vital support in order to live independently. Free personal care should be extended to cover all people who require it in order to lead independent lives. Enable Scotland tell us that their members are concerned about the sustained affordability of social care charging, that they can't afford to do the things they'd like to, and that they're often going without. Jim Elder Woodward of the Scottish Independent Living Coalition is right when he says that we now understand that childcare should be viewed as a social infrastructure investment 
and that this now should be extended to social care support. And I too would like to thank all of those who have provided us with such excellent briefings today. I think the number of briefings we've received is testimony to the, numbers of, the number of lives this issue touches. I mean, they're very well researched from those who have direct experience um, you know, of the impact of this charge. I can't mention them all because I, I would use my, my whole four minutes, presiding officer, uh, but they're very powerful. And they make us aware of the many inconsistencies in the current regime for care charges. While the cost of procuring care does, of course, differ between different areas, with care in rural areas being more expensive to provide, for example, the current differences in care charges between local authorities can't only be explained by the differing costs of care. Charges for home care services vary from free in Fife to £23.70 an hour in Angus, according to Inclusion Scotland. And the taper local authorities apply to determine charges for care also varies hugely from 15% of disposable income to 100%. And the rules that govern the calculation of charges can also vary hugely. Care charging by councils is self-regulated. COSLA develops guidance for the calculation of charges and local authorities are supposed to take this into account when setting charging policies. And whilst COSLA recommend a list of sources of incomes to disregard for the purpose of calculating care charges, they are recommendations only. This could mean, for example, that the very welcome increase in carers allowance that the Scottish Government is pledging to introduce could be immediately swallowed up by care charges in some areas of Scotland, while in others it might be disregarded. So it's difficult to see any justification for this level of inconsistency. The benefit system operates on criteria that apply to everyone, regardless of where they live. As free or reduced cost care is a benefit in kind, so determining eligibility for it shouldn't be subject to such different approaches in different parts of the country. Clearly then, we need to urgently bring some consistency to care charging as a first step towards phasing out charges for care. This can be done under existing legislation. The Scottish Government has the power to, to regulate care charges under the Community Care and Health Act 2002. A decision was made at the time for those powers to be held in reserve until the implementation of guidance issued by COSLA in 2002 could be evaluated. Now, this evaluation has never been carried out and 14 years later it can reasonably be described as overdue and I'd um, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's um, comments on that. The abolition of disability living allowance and the reduced number of claimants being able to access the new PIP payment will impact too. Reductions in the income of people who use services may well take more individuals below charging thresholds and place additional demands on stretched resources. Um, winding up, presiding officer. Um, the 2014-15 COSLA charging guidance says that consideration is currently being given by the Scottish Government to mitigating the impact the changes will have and I'd appreciate an update from the Cabinet Secretary on progress. Um, presiding officer, I'm very pleased we're having this debate about abolishing care charges, but as others have suggested, it needs to come in the broader context of the new powers coming to this Parliament, opportunities for progressive taxation that can cover these costs. If we believe in healthcare free at the point of delivery, we have to consider this seriously now. We want to live in a truly inclusive Scotland. This unfair tax must be abolished. Let's start now. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen four-minute speeches stretched quite so much as in, in this <laughs> member's debate. I now call Shona Robson to wind up the debate. Um, around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Right, th thanks very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think today's debate has highlighted a, a number of issues around social care in Scotland, uh, particularly around the, the fairness of charges for social care, but also some wider issues. Uh, I thank uh, Joanne Lamott for bringing the debate, but also for the tone that she struck, a uh, very constructive tone. Also, uh, I would want to add my voice to welcome, welcoming the, the role of uh, campaigners in focusing our minds uh, on the issue of fairer charging and particularly Amanda Copel, who I've met a, a number of times. Uh, Joanne Lamont's motion uh, calls for the Parliament to uh, explore ways of making charging fairer and I want to start off by just outlining some of the progress that we've made on the journey to make charging fairer. The additional 200 £50 million pounds that was provided for uh, social care in this year has uh, achieved a number of things. 
Firstly, it's worth noting, of course, that it's helped to deliver the living wage for 40,000 care workers, which is important in making sure that the services that people receive uh, have the, the staff there to deliver those services. But, of course, within that, £250 million was the £6 million that a number of members have referred to, which was provided to allow local authorities to uh, raise the, the charging threshold in order to take around 900 people out of charging altogether, but importantly, to also reduce the charges for a further 13,000 uh, people. The £6 million, £6 million, as I said when I announced it, was the first step uh, towards fairer charging and it was deliberately aimed at uh, prioritising those with the lowest incomes to help reduce their charges or take them out of ch charging uh, completely and I hope that is a priority that people would, would agree was important. We also listened to campaigns like Gordon Aitman's campaign for an end to charges uh, in the, the last stage of terminal illness. And of course, from the 1st of April 2015, we ensured that no one in the last six months of a terminal progressive illness was charged for the care they received at home. And looking forward, from next April, we've committed to ensuring that the guaranteed income payments and war pensions for armed forces veterans are excluded from consideration as income for the purposes of social care assessment. So some progress made and some further progress to be made. In response to the concerns raised by the campaigns, including the Franks uh, Law campaign, today I can confirm again that we've committed to conducting a feasibility study over the course of the next year into the possibility of extending free personal care to those under the age of 65 with a diagnosis of dementia. It is a complex matter. Members have, of course, pointed to the fact that uh, there are other conditions uh, for those who are under uh, 65 uh, beyond that of dementia that have to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, and of course, I'm very happy. Uh, I will in a second. I'm very happy, though, to keep members informed of the progress of that work as we take it forward in response to, I think it was Miles Briggs asking for uh, cross-party discussions. I'm very happy to use that feasibility study as the, the, uh, the, the focal, focal point of those uh, discussions. I'll take it. John McAlpine. Yeah, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention, and I'm sure many people would welcome the feasibility study for, for um, dementia sufferers under 65 and also the, the uh, points she made about veterans. But did she accept the point that, I mean, my interest is particularly around learning disabilities, the vice convener of the Learning Disability Cross Party Group. And um, some particular groups have more effective, have more lobbyists than others and they're higher profile. And I would be concerned that if we pick out certain particular areas, you know, lots of people have experience of dementia, for example, there's a big profile for veterans organisations, but perhaps people with learning disability don't have as many people to speak for them. And that can, you know, like, I think there should be more equity in these matters. Shona sure, Robson. A general sympathy with the point that Joe McAlpine makes is that it is difficult to just um, select uh, um, one group of people with a particular diagnosis because I think that would create other unfairness. So the feasibility study, although focused on those under 65 with dementia, I think we'd have to cast a wider look at uh, the issue more generally of uh, charging for those uh, for free personal care under 65. But again, I'm happy to keep members informed uh, as we take that forward. One of the biggest, uh, can I just make a little bit of progress? One of the biggest concerns that has been repeatedly highlighted in uh, tonight's debate is the variation between local authorities and the charges they make for social care. And this does make it difficult for people with disabilities to move between local authority areas and it can cause frustration uh, when they see a lower charge in a neighbouring authority for the same service. Now, as a result, COSLA have implemented a new standard financial assessment which should begin to bring closer alignment between local authorities and how they assess charges for care. And we're determined to make further progress in improving fairness. But we are clear that if they don't uh, improve, that we can use uh, legislative powers to ensure this happens, as was outlined by Alison uh, Johnson. Um, I'll take Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs. Cabinet Secretary for taking this intervention. Um, what I wanted to really 
here and see how we develop this is the fe feasibility study which you've spoken about is very much just focused on dementia. Is there an opportunity to widen that to life limiting conditions so that we can have this, the information we are all looking for which currently isn't out there and then take forward the, the debate that way? Shona Robson. As I said earlier, I think it would be hard to look at just dementia because that would be in danger of creating other unfairness. So I think we'd have to cast a wider look at the issue of, of charging for under 65s for free personal care. But obviously the focus and the, the, the catalyst was uh, the unfairness around dementia. But as I say, I think we'd have to look at the, the wider issue as part of that feasibility study. We are, as I said earlier, putting uh, additional money into social care. Uh, health and social care partnerships now manage more than £8 billion of resources that NHS boards and councils previously managed separately. And that is important, bringing those budgets together. Uh, the, the, over the course of this parliament, there will be uh, £1.3 billion of resources going into social care um, that is important investment. Local authorities in Scotland are providing over 676,000 uh, hours of care each week in Scotland to people in their own homes, with the average number of hours of home care received uh, at more than doubling since the year 2000. And I think that reflects the fact that people with more complex needs now are managing to remain in their own home, and that is important. And with the implementation of self-directed support, the number of people choosing a direct payment to purchase the services they require continues in to increase too, with uh, over 7,500 clients and an estimated £94.5 million spent during the last financial year on that, both up about 10% on the previous year. So people are being able to remain with that increased level of independence in their own homes. And added to that, of course, is the support to carers that has been uh, provided and, of course, funds like the Independent Living Fund, which is helping people with disabilities to live independent lives. Of course, a fund that hasn't been continued in England, but is being continued here in Scotland and going to be opened up to, uh, to new applications. So, I appreciate what members have said, that there is work to be done in this area. I accept that, but I also hope members will accept that we have made progress, particularly in relation to the, the fairer charging uh, elements that have already been um, introduced. But we, under no circumstances, think that is the job done. That is why we're making further progress over the next financial year, why we're having the feasibility study to look at what more we can do. We're determined to do what we can, particularly to help those on the lowest incomes. And that's why we focused on the threshold. Very briefly, uh, Joanne Lamont. I was really to go back to the point about having the courage to think about more than just simply managing the resources that we have. If the feasibility study leads to an identification of just gross injustice and unfairness, are there circumstances which the Scottish Government would look at how they would increase resources through the tax powers they've got or redistributing the resources they already have um, towards meeting this kind of need? I just want to know what the, the boundaries are to the con conclusions you may draw from the feasibility study. Okay. Shona Robson. Well, I think it's worth just putting on the record, of course, that we are um, looking at uh, raising income. So, for example, we're not passing on the tax cut for the better off, as the UK government is doing. We are making changes to the higher council tax bans in order to raise income. So it wouldn't be fair to say that, that, uh, that there are not adjustments being made, that they're raising income uh, for, uh, for public services. Uh, there is. But uh, within the context of the feasibility study, we need to look at uh, what the options are. I took a decision that I thought it was important to focus the initial raising of the threshold on those on the lowest incomes, because there were those, there were people who were paying social care charges who were on very, very low incomes. By raising that threshold, that has um, been a step in the right direction. Now, there are further steps that could be made around the threshold or there are other policy decisions we can make. What I want from the feasibility study is to look at what those options are and of course that will involve costings and uh, looking at the choices then that we can make within the resources that we have uh, within uh, this, uh, this parliament. So I hope members will appreciate the tone that I have taken in responding to uh, the issues that have been made that is work in progress and I'm very happy to continue the dialogue with uh, members who are interested across this chamber. I close this meeting.